Because the things that we learned about ourselves, our bank, our customers, our members, these form the foundation for what you've got to do going forward. So we're here to talk about how can you compete. And by the way, Jeff, wherever you're sitting, your comments were great to kind of open things up. Um, so we're going to lay out, we're going to talk about some of these trends in a little more detail. I'm going to give you some things to think about, and then we're going to lay out three things that you can do. Because competing is not just showing up and, as, as you mentioned, people that are a bricks and mortar location down the street. That's not who you're competing against. All right, so I have some words for you. It takes me forever to get to the actual formal slide part of my presentation. So here's the things I want you to think about. And I want you to write down these words, and I want you to remember them. Wow, you guys are great. And I'm on the front end of the golf course. I'm, I'm impressed. The first word is embedded. Banking is becoming embedded in everything else that we do. You know, Jeff mentioned Amazon and so forth. Banking is something that we do, not necessarily someplace that we go. It is a platform, not a place, and it is a verb, not a noun. And embedded finance, and I'm going to talk to you about companies that are doing that. You know, we have relationships as consumers with super apps and, and Google and Amazon and Facebook. And so when they offer us a credit card or Walgreens offers us a checking account, due to the sheer numbers, some of us are going to say yes. So the idea is how can we embed what we do within the companies that sell products and services to our customers? So that's the first thing. The second is context. C-O-N-T-E-X-T, -E -T, context. I'm not going to use your mobile app. I'm not going to buy your mortgage product. I'm not going to really say yes to anything that you offer me until you prevent, provide it in a way, present it to me in a way that's within the context of how I live my life. It is more about how and when and not where. The third word is personalization. Okay, how many of you feel like you win the Amazon package delivery prize uh, of, the, of the neighborhood. How many of you feel like you've got more boxes that sit on your front door? Well, all they did is get us started on the idea that we want something that's personalized to us. I don't give a rip or what products or services you offer until you present it through the filter that I can hear and see and within my life and how you're going to make me get to my goals faster, help me solve a problem faster, help me get to retirement or kids college or whatever. So. And probably the most important is mindset. We have to step into a mindset that, yes, of course, it is about growth. But we have to reevaluate how we judge success, what our profit levers are, what our customers need, what good service means. And so we have to be careful of our own mindset because that affects your culture. OK, so embedded. Context, personalization, and mindset. Those are the words I want you to think about. All right, I guess we'll show you some slides now. All right, let me double check, make sure the pointer is working. Ah, there we go, okay. Okay, so some of you were closed last year. Maybe you were closed from March to July. This is not about and, and I just want to put it out there. Obviously, we know that we're kind of riding in and out of some of this right now with Delta. But the mindset issue is what I want to get at here. This is not about just opening up the doors and turning the lights back on, taking the close for business sign out, and getting back to business as usual. There is no business as usual. It is about a whole new paradigm in terms of how you're going to bank. So I want you to let go of that idea of we're going to let go or get back to business as usual. And I think most of you, based on your responses, have already embraced that idea. So good for you. Now, I mentioned Amazon here. There's the boxes on the front door. You know, I don't know about you. I live in a small condo building. There's eight units. When I walk in the front door, I'm like, gosh, everybody has all their packages delivered, and it's more and more. And I live in Seattle, so of course it's worse anyway. But, but think about that for a minute. What did Amazon teach us? What did they teach us? Right here. You an Amazon shopper? You bet. All right. Why? Immediacy. Immediacy. What else? Convenience. Convenience. What else? 
and I know it's a classic example, we talk about it, but they have redefined what we expect in terms of the customer experience. They have redefined what speed and simplicity and security mean. So as we look at change consumer behavior, I want you to remember those three words. I give you a lot of words. Speed, simplicity, and security. So ask yourself, at your bank, at your credit union, can we deliver things with speed and simplicity and security? And are we making it known that we're keeping customers' data confidential and private? This is the expectation. So what they say is that our last good experience at another retailer, at another super app, is the new expectation that we have of you. So I do a lot of strategic planning. And often what comes out of some of this stuff is there's that tendency to snap back and do what Ray Davis from Umqua Bank does and say it's easy to snap back into what was. You've got to be thinking of a whole new paradigm and mindset around planning, around this question. What does it mean today to be a community bank or a credit union? Now, you thought you might get a lot more answers, but I also ask you a lot of questions. Now, what we know is, and this is a, a graph that says banks, but I think we could say credit union just as well. Our propensity to want to switch banks or credit unions this year has never been higher. And according to survey data by Rival, they surveyed 100,000 people, plus actually, between November of last year and January of this year, and they found out, get this number, 17% statistically valid of consumers plan to switch banks in 2021. 31% of small businesses plan to switch. So we've got to be paying attention to that. And the other interesting thing about this data from Mobiquity, where this graph came from, is it's, it's across all generations. But what they found out is that 11% of people have already switched, and the majority of those people are millennials. So the oldest millennial is roughly 40 right now. They're in their peak earning years. They're jumping into that. So not only do you have to be looking at all the regulation and all the other things that you've got to do, but the customers that have always banked with you, there is no guarantee that they're gonna stay with you. Now, you might say, if this is the, how do we compete, and this is the feel good portion of the presentation, I'm not feeling it. I get it. Okay, so think about that. It's across generations, and of course, the younger people are more likely to switch, so the millennials and Gen Z are kind of a double-edged sword. They're your greatest path to growth. They're the ones that are going to the big banks and drove. Bank of America, by far, leading more than anyone else. They took 33% of all the Gen Z and all the millennial new accounts open in the last 18 months. But it's everyone. So you gotta earn it. And one of the ways you've gotta earn this is you've gotta listen more carefully to your customers than you ever have before. Now, how many of you have chatbots? <clears throat> raise your hand. It's not a trick question, raise it, raise your hand. Okay. All right, I'm gonna talk to you about TD Bank. So TD Bank in 2017, they launched their chat bot, chat blot, bot, I'm sorry, not blot. Her name is Clary. And they started the, moving along and, and so the chat feature allowed them to, you know, get information, customers could get a, an answer to their question and so forth. And they were moving along pretty well and then along came the pandemic and of course, you know, they're, they're bigger than probably everybody in this room combined, but they had, just millions and millions of requests and customers. And what, during pandemic? So what they did is they created a tool that allowed people to get their questions answered. Is the branch open? How do I use your mobile app? How do I deposit my check? Whatever. During the period of April to October of last year, having a chat bot with a, a personality named Clary allowed them to deflect 1.7 million calls that would have gone to their call center. And instead, they offered their customers a 24-7 solution that gave them questions that maybe just needed a little bit of human or AI-driven human help to answer that and a lot of pandemic things. But what that did is it freed up the customer contact center, the call center, to take on the more advanced problems, opportunities, and so forth. So chatbot is an expectation that we have. You've engaged with it. You've engaged with other companies where all of a sudden you're on their website and up it pops and they want to start asking you questions, right? This is what we expect. We want our problem solved now. We want an answer now. We don't want to wait till you're open tomorrow morning at nine o'clock in order to do that. 
So these are some of the things that you need to not only be thinking about, but explore how do we make this happen? Because it doesn't matter if you are urban or rural, big town, small, whatever it is, people's behavior doesn't change that much, whether they live in a small town or they live in Omaha. All right. Now, at the risk of sounding politically incorrect, but you have to look at finding new ways to make profit. Because overdraft protection has become a dirty word. And then you add in, you know, Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd protests and everything. And what this means is that the consumer has all the power. And big bank or small, credit union big or small, you're lumped into the old idea, this bad thing that overdraft is bad. So then Elizabeth Warren is grilling Jamie Dimon and $31.3 billion were made in overdraft last year. And so there is a perception problem. And as Brett King, the bank futurist said, he said, it's not about doing the right thing. It's about being perceived to do the right thing. And of course, you're going to do the right thing. So you have banks and credit unions of all sizes and a lot of the bigger banks like Huntington and PNC and so forth. And even Ally Bank has, has decided they're eliminating overdraft fees forever. So that is a major source of how a lot of institutions make a chunk of their money, right? So if that is starting to, in the court of public opinion, find different workarounds and the banks are, are allowing anything under $50 to go through without an overdraft fee, you need to be looking at this because how consumers perceive us is their reality and whether it's true or not. So you need to be thinking about some of these things. All right. So. Our relationship to cash and credit has changed. Remember credit, remember, or excuse me, remember cash? Who keeps cash in their wallet? Yeah, nobody. I, I, I hadn't had cash in my wallet since March of 2020, and so I went to the Michigan Bankers Conference where I spoke, and it was up at the Grand Hotel up in Mackinac, and I think some people were there, actually. Uh, anyway, um, I had to have cash, because they still wanted cash for the tips and all the other things, and it's, it's, it, it was like, wow, we don't want to touch it. We don't want to touch the coins. We don't want to touch the money and so forth. So credit is being revolutionized. And I want to give you some stats here. So let me check my notes, make sure I give you all the numbers that I want to give you. I'm a note checker, you guys, so bear with me. Okay. So we're going to talk about some ways that we're getting credit right now. So how many feel like you can't compete in the consumer credit arena? It's like, it's just not something you want to do. Okay. All right. Buy now, pay later. First of all, I want you to raise your hand if you've heard of it. Okay, that's a good sign. All right. How many of you have a Peloton bike? Anybody? All right, raise your hand. We're your proud Peloton person. I know gone are the days where we exchange Twitter handles. It's now our Peloton handles, right? Okay. Did you buy the bike uh, at a store or did you buy it online? Online. Okay, all right. Anybody buy it in the store? Okay, all right, I'm gonna tell you my Peloton story. All right, I'm an avid runner and after 15 uh, marathons so far, my knee was giving me a problem last year and I had to get my meniscus kind of fixed, right? So uh, my knee doc says, you know, have you get a Peloton. So I went to the Peloton store just to figure out, I would just look, you know, just see what it's about. Well, that, you know how that turned out. So the experience was great. You know, I got on the bike, I was able to ride for a half hour, no pain. So when I go to pay, and of course I bought the mat and the weights and, you know, every possible everything. And so $2,600 or later, whatever it was, I go to pay, I pull out my debit card and he goes, oh no, no, you know, you can do this with buy now, pay later. And we have a partnership with a firm and you can have this at 0% interest and you can pay over 12 months, 24 months or 39 months, I think was the other choice. So why is this important? You might say, I'm not competing in the consumer credit market, I don't care, but your consumers do. So Affirm and some of their fellow other companies like Klarna and so forth, they're in more than I think 30% of the big retailers in the country. This is an alternative to consumer credit cards. And anybody at the under age of 40 feels that credit cards are bait and switch, they don't trust it, it's, a, you know, it's, it's all wrong. So what Peloton as an example is doing is they're, they're expediting the experience. They made it so easy, you know, all I did is he sent me the code to my phone, I fill out, I ask a few questions, the credit's approved, the loan documents are there, I click, I sign, and in less than three minutes the whole thing is done. 
and in my box are the completed loan documents. Now, this is important because what they're tapping into is what all fintechs tap into. They pick a customer pain point and they solve it and they use data and they create a customer experience that gets back to that speed comment and that ease of use. But why this is important is that it's going to be a $126 billion market this year. And it is, it's affecting the mindsets of consumers of all generations, but especially people under the age of 40. This is going to replace the use of a credit card for some. So if you make money on credit cards, um, that might be another threat to your profit. So it gets back at how consumers think and feel and behave. Now, the other thing we have to acknowledge is this. You know, there are a lot of different stories out there. Some people are, are doing great and they took their stimulus money, they put it in the bank and they're feeling cash rich. They didn't spend a lot of money during the pandemic so their credit score is really good. They sold their place in town, they moved further out to an exurb where they could get more space for less money. So things are changing but also there's been a lot of people who have been financially devastated. So what you have to do, your job is so much more important and broader than being quote a banker. You're a psychotherapist. You're a listener. And what you have to do is engage people in how they're thinking and feeling and what their financial situation is about. Because I've never met a group of people anymore more qualified than, than bankers like you to be able to address that. So we have to tap into the mindset, there's that word again, of consumers and ask them one simple question. How has this experience during the pandemic for you? What's the problem or opportunity and how can we help? So. We've got to think of this when 51% of US adults say that the economic impact would make it harder for them to achieve their financial goals. Well, guess what? I'm looking at a whole room full of people who can help them to set goals and recalibrate their strategy. Because one of the things I'm going to say to you at the end here is you've got to recalibrate your strategy too. But maybe it starts is with helping your customers. And I'm not saying that you don't. Now, Jeff had alluded to, you know, the geography of competition. Oh, forget who's down the street. It doesn't matter anymore. You know, if I'm looking for, I don't know, a car loan, a bike loan, whatever it is, I'm going to look at the providers that can provide me that solution when and how I want it and not necessarily where. Now, I'm not here to get into the politics of CRA defined areas or anything like that. But we have to recognize, just like you alluded to the talent thing, um, if I had a dime for every time someone said to me, a banker said, you know, we need a really good chief marketing officer, but no one wants to move to Lincoln, Nebraska. Well, now you can go to Atlanta, Georgia if you need it. So I want you to expand your wings. I want you to expand your mindset and say, maybe if we're a, a lender to dental practice as an example, maybe we look at dental practices across a multi-state area. But we have to recognize that the geography of competition is changing. All right. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about embedded finance. You know, Walmart earlier this year, and this is kind of a separate issue, but they announced that they were forming their own fintech so that they could provide banking services for the 2.5 million Americans who work for Walmart, not to mention however many customers do. So yes, your worst fear has come true. Walmart is in the banking business, but it's not in the bricks and mortar business. But the idea of embedded finance is, let's say that I go to walmart.com or I walk into a store, and again, I, I buy a fairly high ticket item. Maybe I buy a really expensive outdoor grill and it's $1,500. And so the idea is in embedded finance is that we have a relationship with a trusted brand, call it Walmart that they can offer us a payment plan, maybe in three, six, 10 payments or whatever, and we can pay for that expensive grill. All right, so how many of you go to a Walgreens store? The Pharmacy America Trust, right? Okay, so as part of their, I wish I could remember exactly how they said this. They have a word for it. I wanna read you what they said in their press release. Hold on, because it's really good and it tells you a lot. Um, as part of their alternative profit strategy, by the way, Walgreens stores, same store sales are diving. The stores aren't busy. We can buy our drugs online, our prescriptions online, that is. Uh, maybe the other stuff too, but I'm not here to talk about that. 
But um, what they realized is that the writing was on the wall, that consumer behavior has changed and people aren't coming to the store as much. So they, beginning July 1st, just like two months ago almost, they started offering checking accounts in all 9,000 of their stores and at walgreens.com. So the pharmacy that America trusts decides it's going to get into the banking business. You trust them and they say, hey, by the way, you know, we can offer you a checking account. Certainly not everybody's going to say yes, but I think it's something like one in three Americans shops at a Walgreens or lives within five miles of a store. So again, banking is being embedded inside what we do. So let's take another example. Anybody in here uh, bank dental practices? All right. Oh, you, you do. Okay. So you make, what do you make? Commercial loans for equipment and to get their practice up and running? Okay. So, so imagine this. Imagine your, one of your biggest dental lending practices that you make loans to. Let's say that they do cosmetic dental stuff and it's not covered by insurance. And so somebody comes in there and they want a, a $3,000 new mouth of teeth and they're whiter and more aligned. So imagine if that dental practice could then say to that customer, because it's pro processed by you, that they can offer them this payment plan, um, just like a firm is doing at Peloton. And so banking as a service is something that you need to be looking at with some of your clients who buy maybe bigger ticket items. You with me so far? Let's take another example. Anybody here have T-Mobile as their, their phone provider? I said this in Colorado and it's, they say that 73 million people have a, a, a package with T-Mobile, but whenever I've been in an audience, it's certainly not in the states I've been in. But the, <laughs> but the point is, 73, 76 million customers, whatever. In January of 2019, before the pandemic, they formed an alliance with Bank Mobile, which was one of the first techs, first um, fintechs to be kind of a mobile digital only bank. Now, everybody that has T-Mobile, when they get the update on their phone, up pops the app offering them the T-Mobile banking services. Banking is something that we do. It is not necessarily someplace that we go. It is embedded in with the other brands and the other companies that we do business with. Now, if I'm making you a little bit uncomfortable to say, yeah, I heard about this, but I had no idea. Look at the reach. Look at the reach of what they're doing. And so ask yourself, what does this mean for us and what we do? If this is how our customers are being exposed to banking competitors, what do we do about that? All right. Bricks and mortar. You're looking at a guy up front who started his company in 1993 doing site selection for branch expansion. Yeah, well, how's that working out today? We're doing the same studies, but it's like helping banks unwind a lot of that stuff. But let's face it, again, it is about the how and the when, not necessarily the where. But there is a stat. Let's see if it's in this here or not. Oh, let me back up. So Credit Karma did a study of people and their branch banking behaviors pre and post pandemic. Pre pandemic, they found out that roughly a third of consumers uh, visited a branch on a somewhat regular basis. They went back to those same people as we're coming out of the pandemic, and I still think we are, and more than half of those people said that they had no reason or purpose or desire to go back to a branch. So the other conversation, in addition to how do we make money if it's not going to be from overdraft and the other things I mentioned, is this bricks and mortar question is going to have to be solved. And that's not the focus of this presentation, but it's certainly something, again, you got to tap into consumer behavior. All right. Well, I've got some more stats for you here. All right. So U.S. Bank started embedding video into their mobile app experience. And probably a number, if you're at Capital One, they probably do that as well. And so there's that idea of embedded in a different way. The one thing that, that they've talked about is that they have a screen sharing experience where a banker and a customer can share a screen and they can look at things together and they can do it together. And what they found out, they're going to do like 2 million co-browsing sessions this year. And they found out that bankers, customers, still want to see that familiar, friendly face of the banker that maybe is in their hometown. 
and they found out that having that human connection and that visual experience, you know, call it embedded Zoom inside your banking app, allowed people to feel not so isolated and not so disconnected, that they like that idea. And so you can still have a face-to-face -face connection and it may happen digitally. But they continue to push that envelope. They have one of the best apps in the industry, but they realize again that people want to see a smiling face on the other side. It helps them feel connected. It helps, makes the sale go faster, all of the above. All right, how many of you look at the workplace and say, scratch your head and say, I have no idea? Okay, <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's go back to some of the basic things I wanna say here about the workforce. You need to assess the skill set that you need, not only now coming out of this pandemic, but if you can project it out two to three years from now, what are the skill sets you're, you're gonna need? Now, Brett King had said, one of his famous comments that I love is he said, you know, we need really good data analytics people and we need good storytellers. So you're gonna end up having to hire different kinds of talent and that talent may not live anywhere near where your branch footprint is and it will no longer matter. The other thing that we know about is flexibility. You know, this work from home model, some loved it, some hated it, but collectively, according to the research, seven in 10 employees expect their bank to be flexible when it comes to workplace policy. So this is a big strategic initiative that how you compete, how you compete not only for customers but for talent is you've got to create flexibility. You know, people learned about themselves. Some of them handled it pretty well. It's like, wow, I handle my schedule better than I thought I would. I have a little more free time. Like up in, I'm in where Seattle, people are like, I hated the commute. It was like an hour and a half to two hours each way. Why would I do that? So we have clients that have never opened their branches since March of last year. They don't see any reason to do that even now. So the idea of part of the way you're competitive is by attracting good talent. Part of the way you're competitive is by creating a workplace experience. It's not just about the customer experience that makes people want to work with you and stay working with you. All right. So Jamie Dimon said it, you know, you ever want to see where, what they're up to is look at their investor day presentations. But this is something he said earlier on that banks are playing an increasingly smaller role in the financial system. So alternative methods of profit. Do you really know who your customers are? Do you know what they need? Do you know the challenges that they've had? Or are you making assumptions? Because your path to growth, your path to being able to compete is to be able to really understand each cohort of customers you have with razor sharp clarity, razor sharp clarity, and being able to offer them a solution. All right, so how do you do that? Number one, you've got to recalibrate your strategy. Just like your customers maybe have to have a new strategy for retirement because it sort of got postponed a couple years perhaps or whatever. You've got to look at your strategy going forward. You know, when I work with banks and strategic planning, I love to read what they have before, and it's some massive document. Sometimes it has to be bound, and it's absolutely worthless because nobody looks at it. Number one, you've got to do and calibrate your strategy within the context of the market and the market segments that you serve. And you might need to redefine your market area beyond the community CRA, CRA designation. But Looking at the post-virus world, you're going to have to be more agile and more aware, and you're going to have to actively use data. So your investment, whether it's in data warehousing, your investment in people to be able to analyze that data, mine it for insights, build the algorithms so that you can provide a personalized experience for your customers. And this is not just for Bank of America. There are smaller banks doing this all across the country. You need different skill sets. It's out there. What did I want to say about this slide? We've got too many apps, sorry. Uh, yes, okay. So, US Bank again. One of the things that they realize is that consumers, businesses, whoever, they want to look at the totality of their relationship all in one place. So what US Bank has been doing is building partnerships 
with other companies so that if I'm one of their customers, I can go into the mobile app and I can look at everything I have at their bank and Charles Schwab and State Farm. So they're aggregating the data. So, but their investment in the use of data and the use of partnerships to provide the customer with a better experience and a more holistic total look at their finances is where they're headed. Now, trust is earned when you provide customer-centric convenience on a consistent basis. And trust, and while bankers have more trust than most industries, while banks and credit unions do, uh, trust is being eroded. So what you're gonna have to do is again, step back into the game, have conversations with your customers, get to know them better, and really start building that trust by giving them helpful insights on a consistent basis. So one of the things that, you know, we hear a lot about customer experience, but that is really true. So I mentioned three words when we had the diagram of the Amazon with the boxes sitting on the front steps, speed, simplicity, and security. So you need to figure out what is the desired customer experience that you need to create now. And it's not just in the bricks and mortar world. It's on the phone, it's via the chat bot, it's on your mobile app, it's all the above. All right, so how many of you have ever taken an Uber? That's probably like a really dumb answer, like the majority of you, right? Okay, so let's talk for a minute about how they got started. So back, I think it was 2008, you've got the, the founders of what ultimately became Uber were in Paris, France, on some rainy night, I think in a November, and they're trying to find a cab and it's not working and it's not working and nobody's showing up and they, they spoke French, but that wasn't the issue. And so one of them said to the other one, you know, what about if we could like order a ride on our phone? Novel idea, customer pain point. It's difficult to find a cab. Nobody shows up when it's raining. So what they did is they created Uber around that very idea. They found a customer pain point they built a solution, they got it to the market, they beta tested this thing like 18 months later in San Francisco and New York, and the rest they say is the proverbial history. So what I want you to think about, you know, FinTech can be a scary word, then don't use FinTech. Pick one problem, better yet, I want you to make a list of problems that customers have, and if you don't know, then ask them about what it's like to engage with you. Maybe your, your check deposit feature in your mobile app is terrible. Maybe your call center is terrible. Maybe your branch people aren't trained the way they should be. Find a customer pain point, get a team together, give them a little budget, and figure out a solution. That is how FinTechs think. There's the word mindset again for you. Solve the problem, because you know, again, think of all the different, you know, Venmo and PayPal and all these. All they did is start with a singular problem. What bankers tend to do sometimes is I think overcomplicated, figuring they've got to lay out the whole thing. Figure out one problem at a time, solve it. Because when you do, that's when you build the trust in the customers. That's when they start to have confidence in you. And believe me, there's plenty of problems within your experience that you could solve right now. So if you walk out of here, other than remembering the word speed, simplicity, and security, then also get a team together and come up with a list of problems that need to be solved. And if you don't know, ask your customers. That is how you build the customer experience, by consistent improvements in the right direction. Okay, now the cloud. I am in by no means a, a cloud expert, but if I, I knew this, if I had a dollar, for every time a banker or a credit union that I talked to said, we'd love to do that, but our core will not cooperate. Okay, so that's, that's an ongoing discussion. But what we do know is that groups are coming up with workarounds. And somebody else mentioned a workaround about meeting face to face, I think it was you. So they're coming up with workarounds, they're what they call no code solutions. Now that is my extent of the, the knowledge pace of how cores operate. But think of it this way, they're looking at whole new applications that can layer over the top of their core that allows them to offer a solution to be more responsive to customer needs and so forth. So no code solutions. All right, how many of you have a voice of the customer initiative? In translation, how many of you have a regular system of feedback when you engage with a customer? Okay, what have you learned? Is there, give me one thing you've learned from that experience.
people review your Google ratings. That's what you found out. Okay. And I assume that some of them were not favorable. Is that right for you? Okay. What was a problem that was, what was a, a complaint? Your drive through what about them? Packing up. Packing up, stacking up, too many people, not enough, not enough to get them moving through. Okay. Now, whether you're big or small, I picked Bank of America only because, you know, like, so I flew here on Delta Airlines yesterday, and before you're even at the gate, after you've landed, they say, you know, in about two hours, you're going to get a survey from us in the mail, you know, asking us how we're doing, and I know it sounds like a bunch of whatever, but Bank of America sends out 90 million of those every year, and they get 13 to 15 million responses back. And that gives them data that they can populate a dashboard with, that they can bring that down to the frontline banker who had the experience with the customer to do what? To change things, to make something better, to continuously make improvements. Here's the mindset again. It's about just having a commitment to getting regular feedback from your customers. It doesn't need to be overly sophisticated if you're not there but get the feedback because people want to share their opinion with you. They want to share with you what they need from you, but you have to ask. So voice of the customer is the fun initiative that they call it. All right, culture. We could spend a whole three days talking about culture, but there's kind of the internal culture. And while the formal structure may have been unchanged due to the pandemic, the informal structure has been disrupted under the surface and needs to be realigned. So I'm going to give you some examples of that instead of giving you a bunch of jargon. Okay, so Citizens Bank, you know, and she said quite si simply this, her name is Susan La, La Monica. Okay, she said, we're so used to building relationships face to face, and I heard you say that here. So how do we do that in more of a virtual way? So part of it is the use of data and, and providing personalized interactions based on what they know. So they have big investments in data center. She said it also really works through in the training that they give their customers and they're giving or, or their customer contact people. So really the idea is it starts and she runs this for their bank, but it really is about how do we make the virtual experience more human? Okay, this guy here, his name is Chris Mayer. He is, is chief executive of Ocean First Bank in New Jersey and I first met this guy when I was gonna speak at the New Jersey Banker, so I interviewed him because I'd read an article in the American Banker. At the time, they were $7 billion, they had 100 locations, and if you've ever been to New Jersey, if it's not the taxes that'll kill you, it's the price of real estate. And they said, this is unsustainable. They made some acquisitions. So they wanted to close a third of their branches. Now, so I interviewed him about that. But what I wanna tell you about him today is that they believe that the use of video is key number one to how they're going to grow and provide good service. And so what they do is they interview other people and they assess their, their, their screen presence, their video skills. They interview people there. They take people through training for skills. And I know that there are some Zoom etiquette stuff. This goes way beyond that. He said, you know what, we can bring in the right technology. That's not the problem. But he said, finding bankers that are comfortable have a good screen presence, like the, mod the modality or, or whatever. He said, this is what we need to do. Because they said the future of our mobile banking experience is gonna be a lot more vid video. And you know, again, whether that is providing access to line of business specialists, because you can't have an investment person or a mortgage person in every physical branch that you have. So what they're investing time in is screen-based skill sets. And this is how they're interviewing people. And they were doing that even before the pandemic. All right. The other thing about culture is you got to talk about the elephant in the room. So this is a really fun story. So I'm going to read you this. Everyone needs to know what is okay, what is allowed, what is welcomed. You need to lead the dance of showing things are not off limits. So this banker here, I forgot his name. I think it was Brian. We'll call him Brian Banker. And, and Brian's senior management at his bank, he was the intern, by the way, so guess what job he got. But the bank realized that the culture, there was a lot of stuff that was not being talked about. And they felt that the staff had a lot of good ideas, but they were afraid to make those suggestions, good or bad, for fear of retribution. So what they needed is a radical intervention to say, you can talk about anything here. We need your feedback. We need your ideas and your advice and your criticism, and you're not going to lose your job. So what they did is they got a, a, a suit 
an elephant suit, and Brian the banker, in his like first 30 or 45 days of working at the bank, he went to work every day wearing an elephant suit. And it became a metaphor for this. Talk to Brian the banker. Talk to the elephant in the room about what needs to be said. He would go to lunch. He'd ride the elevator. You know, he would go visit other branches. All that stuff. It became a visual metaphor to say, we are trying to become a more open culture. And your opinion, your ideas, your criticism matter here. So we want to send the message that it's OK. And it really has worked. So recalibrating your strategy and focusing on your culture and focusing on customer experience, those are the three pillars of how you're going to be able to compete. And the things that I mentioned along the way and you know, buy now, pay later, all these other initiatives, focus on the three things that you can do. Again, recalibrate your own strategy. You might need something new and radically different. I think strategic plans and banking are a bunch of wasted paper probably 80% of the time. What do you really need to be planning for? Have that conversation because maybe it's the elephant in the living room about what you have to really face up to, who you're competing against. And if you're really competing against Amazon or Walgreens offering a killer app, are you keeping up? Create the customer experience. Build it around speed, simplicity, security. None of us have any patience anymore. I don't know what the exact thing is, but we spend less than, what is it, 30 seconds on a website or a mobile experience before we abandon it if it's not getting us where we need to go. And tend to the culture. Culture is no longer this fluffy thing that is relegated to the HR department. Culture and brand, in my opinion, are two of the key drivers in the new economy for profit. OK, so before we wrap up, I want you to type it into your iPad. I want you to write down. One thing that resonated with you most about what we've talked about here in the last 45 minutes and what you're going to do in the next 30 days. OK, so a final thought. For those of you who think and hope that things will basically go back to the way that they were, stop because they won't. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to the Federal Home Loan Bank. Thank you to, for Trent for the introduction. And I'm going to turn the stage back over to you, sir.